All right, all week long, we're taking a special look at this quarter of chaos and what investors can do to protect their portfolios from so-called black swan events like the political turmoil we've seen throughout the Middle East and North Africa, as well as the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Well, our next guest says the biggest mistake any investor can make is to try to time the market. Gus Sauter is the chief investment officer of the Vanguard Group, which has $1.6 trillion in assets and is the largest mutual fund company, one of only a handful with more than a trillion dollars in assets under management. Well, he joins us now from the firm's headquarters in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Gus, pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Lisa, for having me. So, Gus, are you surprised at just how resilient, uh, particularly U.S. stock investors, seem to be since we've had a quarter that has been filled with events that no one was predicting? Yeah, there certainly have been a lot of macro events that have been surprising and, and uh, disturbing, but uh, it is also a little surprising how the market has ignored most of this, and you just kind of almost wonder how much higher the market would be without these events. What is your um, take on the current market environment and watching this behavior? Do you think that investors are generally taking on too much risk at the moment? Invest, investors still remain cautious. We see that they are starting to get back into the stock market. Certainly investors pulled away from risk after the bear market of 2008 and 2009. Uh, they are starting to embrace risk again, but, uh, but I'd say it's, it's at a measured pace. So we haven't seen investors throw caution to the wind. Uh, the one disturbing uh, 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 experience has been, I think, with emerging markets. We have seen a lot of money go into emerging markets, although that has calmed down more recently. Here's another question. Vanguard, well known for having a lot of sort of passively managed funds, ETFs, and the world of ETFs has gotten much wider in terms of what is available to invest in. But there is this age-old debate. Do you go with a passive versus an active manager, and does that change depending upon the volatility we see in the market? I don't think it changes depending on the volatility. I think it's really uh, specific to the investor and what they're trying to accomplish. I, th I think that uh, there could be situations where an investor might want to be, or a certain type of investor would want to be 100% indexed. Others might want to be entirely active. It really depends on whether or not you want to take the risk that your active manager will add value above and beyond an index or the, the risk that they might underperform. But those who are willing to take that risk, they might be compensated for it. So. Uh, the, the default probably is to index uh, an, an investment, uh, but if you want to take additional risk with the hope of, of higher return, then you can go with an active investment. Gus, do you have advice on how to find the right active manager? I mean, there's a lot of data available out there. I was looking at an S&P study that was released for 2010, and it was looking at all U.S. equity funds, and you know, almost half of them did not beat their benchmark. They were outperformed by their benchmark. You can see some of the um, this is some of the data right here it was looking at the S&P 1500 over one year, three year, and five years. And it generally looks as if choosing a passive fund or an ETF is a better strategy, but how do you find the right active manager? It's a difficult game. Active management is, is quite difficult. Um, one thing to, to look for, the best defining feature is cost. So cost comes in really two forms. One would be the expense ratio of the fund itself, and a high cost fund just has a huge handicap to overcome. The other component of cost would be turnover. So a high turnover active manager uh, would also have a, a very significant cost uh, hurdle to overcome. Uh, in addition to that, we look at um, the investment style that the manager uses, we want to make sure that they, uh, they uh, exercise that style consistently over time. If we see that they change their investment style, we lose confidence in the manager. Uh, we do look at past performance, but that's really uh, the last thing we look at because past performance really isn't tremendously predictive of future performance. So it's, it's really more cost and uh, the quality of the manager. Do they stick with their style? Yes, and then just very quickly, we're going to have to go into break, but I do want to ask you when we come back a little bit about diversifying a portfolio. Is it just bonds and stocks, or do you diversify more broadly into commodities and currencies these days? Also, I want to talk to you about the notion of market timing. Can you buy the lows and sell the highs? I want to talk to you about um, diversification, fixed income, and equities. What else do you talk to retail investors about these days? They're much savvier about currency as well as uh, what is happening with interest rates. 
Yeah, so the two big building blocks around a portfolio likely should be uh, equities, stocks, and bonds. But uh, you're right, you can uh, try to moderate some of the volatility inherent in equities by including other asset classes, maybe real estate, uh, perhaps commodities. Um, we're not too wild about the concept of currency itself as an asset class. It, it doesn't have an expected return, so therefore we don't get terribly excited about it. Having said that, I think it is important to invest in international investments such as international stocks as part of your stock portfolio or perhaps international bonds as part of your bond portfolio. But the important thing is to get diversification across a number of asset classes to try to moderate volatility inherent with investing. Now, do you change those allocations depending upon what's happening in the market or would you generally recommend that you keep constant there? Well, we would recommend that you keep constant. I know that a lot of people are saying, uh, given the past decade, that the only way to make returns is to move around in the marketplace. I would agree with that if we were any good at doing it. The problem is that uh, it's always very easy to say what we should have done in the past. It's very difficult to know in advance what you should do going forward. What we find is that investors tend to really chase past returns just in time for that part of the market to turn down. So our advice is figure out an appropriate asset allocation for your your, your circumstances right off the bat and then stick with it because the tendency um, is to really do the exact opposite thing at the wrong time. So uh, we find most investors uh, are more likely to achieve their investment success by sticking with a, a, an appropriate game plan. Marking, market timing from your perspective, not a winning strategy, but let's talk about your outlook for is it the U.S. economy at the moment. You're actually quite bullish on where we're going to end the year despite what we're calling a quarter of chaos chaotic events. <laughs> Yeah, you know, all of these events, uh, uh, they do have some impact, and we have reduced our, our growth estimates for the U.S. economy and for the global economy as well, but we still have them growing at uh, reasonably robust rates. We still think the U.S. economy will grow at uh, 3 percent or, or more for this year, and the world economy will grow at 4 percent or more, which are both uh, attractive growth rates. So, yes, we are bullish despite uh, all of these uh, uh, economic events over the past uh, quarter. I'd say the biggest wild card we're worried about now would be oil. So any further disruption in the Middle East that drove oil prices substantially higher, say to $140 a barrel, would have us very concerned. So $140 sort of is where you think you'd start to revise perhaps your GDP forecast. Let's talk about some of the emerging, you're starting an emerging market fund. This was just recently announced, which will be an actively managed fund. Why do that now? Well, uh, we, we think it's appropriate, first of all, to have an option of either a passive investment in, in emerging markets, which we do offer now as in, in the form of an index fund, or an active alternative to, to an index fund. So it's appropriate to have that product. Why now? Well, um, we, found, we have four managers that we've identified that we uh, know uh, from experience and have a good deal of confidence in. So it, being able to find these managers, uh, we, we now believe we can offer an attractive emerging market. Markets fund. Uh, the one concern that we did have was the fact that emerging markets were so hot and, and investors were chasing them. That seems to have died down here more recently, so we're less concerned about that right now. All right, Gus, appreciate you joining us today. Appreciate the insight. Thank you so much. That was Gus Sauter, Chief Investment Officer of the Vanguard Group.